I see the numbers going up. Folks are still trickling into the Zoom room, but I think we'll um, get the show on this on the road. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar. We are pleased to come to you on an almost weekly basis from the Wilson Center and the National History Center um, to talk about historical perspectives on international and national affairs. This afternoon, we will focus on Walk With Me, a biography of Fanny Lou Hamer, a new book by Kate Clifford Larson. Congratulations, Kate, and welcome to the Washington History Seminar. We are also very fortunate to have with us Alilia Bundles and Robert Harris, Jr., who will provide initial comments and launch our debate, our conversation this afternoon. To both of you, a warm welcome to the Washington History Seminar as well. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the History and Public Policy Program at the Wilson Center, and I have the privilege and pleasure to co-chair this seminar series with Eric Arneson of the National History Center and George Washington University. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the National History Center of the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. Over the past decade plus, the seminar has served as a nonpartisan forum to discuss important new historical findings, insights, and publications. Prior to the pandemic, we met on a weekly basis at the Wilson Center, but we've been very pleased to come to you via Zoom and Facebook since the summer of 2020, and we're delighted that so many more people um, have been able to participate in these sessions. Behind the scenes, two individuals helped produce this event, Rachel Wheatley for the National History Center and Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both of them. We'd like to acknowledge our supporters and welcome your support. Details about how to support the seminar are available in the chat room right now. Simply go to our institutional websites if you prefer. Uh, I'd like to extend my thanks to the GW History Department for institutional co-sponsorship. Finally, join us on Monday in two weeks for a discussion of Margaret Jacobs' new book, After 100 Winters, In Search of Reconciliation on America's Stolen Lands. A quick technical note, um, today's session will be recorded and will soon appear on our um, respective organizations' websites. For the Q&A part of this webinar, where uh, you have three options of participating. Our preference is uh, that you join the conversation, if not by video, at least by, um, uh, by audio, um, by using the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality. You'll um, be put into a queue and we'll call on you. Uh, you have to mute yourself and then please pose your question. A second um, possibility is to post your question or comment in the Q&A function um, at the top, in my case, at the top of the screen, uh, or, you can, um, or you can email Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. Uh, based on past sessions, uh, I know we have some energetic chat room users in uh, the audience please don't use the chat room to pose your questions. That gets very confusing for all of us on the panel. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Eric. Zoom room is all yours. Thank you, Christian. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce our main speaker this afternoon, Kate Clifford Larson, currently a Brandeis University Women's Studies Research Center visiting scholar and a best-selling author of critically acclaimed biographies that include Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero, published in 2003 by Ballantine Books, and Rosemary the Hidden Kennedy Daughter, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt in 2015. Kate Larson is also notably an award-winning consultant for feature films, scripts, documentaries, museum exhibits, and public history initiatives. Today, she will be speaking on her latest work, Walk With Me, a biography of Fannie Lou Hamer, published just two months ago by Oxford University Press. Kate, the Zoom room is all yours. Thank you so much, Eric. It's really great to be here. And I'm excited to talk about uh, Fannie Lou Hamer with the panelists. 
And um, so I'm, I'm just going to talk about 15, 20 minutes or so. And um, I'd like to tell you how I decided to write about Fannie Lou Hamer and um, how I write biographies and how I shaped the way I looked at Fannie Lou Hamer's life. So I learned about Fannie Lou Hamer back in the 1990s when I was in a graduate program in gender studies at Simmons University. And she always stuck with me. Um, but at the time, I had started doing my work on Harriet Tubman, and I pursued my PhD and my dissertation on Tubman, and that was published in 2020, uh, 2004. And I started working um, then, and I still do a lot of consulting that's related to public history about Harriet Tubman, the Underground Railroad, and slavery, et cetera. But Hamer always stuck with me. Um, and I, my interest started migrating to the 20th century. And after doing the work on Rosemary Kennedy, I, I really felt like I, I wanted to pursue more work in the 20th century. And there was Hamer knocking <laughs> at the door, basically. And so I couldn't shake her. And, you know, since, you know, the election of Obama in 2008 and then the way politics were going around 2015, 2016, her voice just got louder in my head and I decided I would start looking at her. So I when I started the biography and the research, I started the way I, I start all of my biographies. I wanted to know who uh, Hamer's family was, who she loved, who her girlfriends were. Um, who the people were in the community, um, what did she do every day, what fortified her, what inspired her, um, just things that every, every person has in their lives, and I wanted to investigate those. So that's how I start a biography, and I get to know that person. <clears throat> and then I wanted to know, how did she become a leader? She came out of the most... Um, obscure circumstances, extreme poverty in the Mississippi Delta as the uh, 20th child of Mississippi sharecroppers. How did she end up in the 1960s on the national stage changing the world? Um, you know, she didn't go to an elite college. She dropped out of school in the sixth grade. And um, so that I, I just thought, how did this powerful woman, this ordinary woman become extraordinary? Because we're all ordinary, but not all of us become extraordinary like a Fannie Lou Hamer. So um, I, I looked at her life and there were, there were, there was a, there's a richness to that story that I hope when people read it, they get that richness and they can see the development of a Fannie Lou Hamer that came out of that, those cotton fields in the Mississippi Delta. So she, as I said, she was the 20th child of uh, Jim and Ella Townsend sharecroppers in Mississippi. Um, but the thing that I discovered in working on my biography is that seven of those children had died before Fannie Lou was born. The survival rate for Black children in the Delta, in Mississippi, in 1917 was one out of four would die before their fifth birthday. <clears throat> so it is, it's tragic to think about all the children that had died before Hamer was born. And in fact, four babies had died in the four years before Hamer was born. <clears throat> And Hamer always talked about how um, her mother doted on her and, you know, treated her as very, very special. Well, now I know why so many of those children had been lost. And then this little baby survived and um, was the, their last child. And she really benefited from this overwhelmingly protective, fierce mother. So she grows up in this poverty stricken life as a sharecropper and um, but you know she has a little bit of education the church is very important in her life her faith is central to her family and the community her father was a part-time baptist minister so she grew up with that the bible and um believing and trusting in god and that the world you know things were going to get better um, by the Great Depression, though, things were not getting better and they actually got worse. Her mother went blind. Um, her father ended up passing away in 1939 um, 
when Hamer was 22 years old. All of her siblings had moved on. Some had gone north or to the east, um, and some were sharecroppers in the area. But she really had the responsibility of taking care of her parents during the Great Depression. But there was always something special about Fannie Lou uh, Townsend. Um, she had a beautiful voice. She could sing even as a child. People loved to hear her sing. She was bright and curious. And even though she had to leave school in the sixth grade, she there was this intensity and um, precociousness about her that sort of made her stand out. Um, and so she, you know, she learned how to make bootleg liquor. Her father taught her. Her father did that on the side. Even though he was a Baptist minister, he made a little liquor on the side because he had to support his family. And she learned that skill, too. Um, so she ends up during uh, World War II marrying a fellow sharecropper in Ruleville, Mississippi, in Sunflower County, Pap Hamer. And um, he was on the Marlowe plantation and he had a slightly better position on the plantation because he was a mechanic and he could take care of those machines in uh, on the plantation. So they had uh, they fell in love. They got married. Um, they had a little juke house. Uh, they, you know, made bootleg liquor just to make ends meet. They adopted two little girls. And they had a fairly stable life, even though they struggled to make ends meet like most sharecroppers. Um, but she always had that drive for she wanted things to be better, like all of her neighbors. But the, the injustice and the discrimination and the racism and the violence that she grew up with that was ever present in Mississippi, the white supremacy in, in Mississippi, the it was just one of the most violent states in the nation. It had more lynchings in Mississippi than any other state. It was, it was a, a cruel, cruel place. And she wanted to make things better. So during the 1950s, as you all know, the civil rights movement takes off in this country. Um, and Fannie Lou Hamer, there were certain things that she would say, and they always made me laugh because as I discovered, so she used to tell audiences, she had no knowledge of the civil rights movement there in the Mississippi Delta during the 1950s and early 60s. And um, it wasn't until the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee members arrived in Ruleville in 1962 that she ever heard that she could vote, register to vote. That's not true. She actually was active in civil rights in Mississippi, and, and um, but she was behind the scenes. She wasn't out in public. She was just doing it you know, trying not to be noticed, but she was doing things. Um, during the 50s and early 60s, only 5% of eligible Black voters in Mississippi could vote. The voter registration laws were terrible, the literacy tests, and the white uh, county clerks just would not approve the, the registrations of of black voters and um, there were poll taxes and it was just a whole myriad of of laws and 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 um, subjugation that prevented people from voting so when um you know she was active even though she denied it later on so she had this little spark you know she wanted to make a change but she didn't know how so when i do a biography i, I try to figure out well what are those moments that shift a person from ordinary to extraordinary. What is, are there decision points, pivotal points? Well, in 1961, um, Hamer and Pap had been struggling uh, for years to have children of their own. They adopted two girls, but they wanted their own children. And she'd had several miscarriages and stillbirths. And um, she had fibroid tumors. So Mrs. Marlowe on the Marlowe plantation suggested that she go to Dr. Charles Doro in Ruleville to have the fibroid tumors removed so that she could possibly get pregnant. And what Daro did, the white doctor, is he sterilized her and said, instead and did not tell her. And she found out when the plantation cook overheard Mrs. Marlowe telling a friend of hers that Doro had sterilized her. So that sent Fannie Lou Hamer spiraling into a depression. She questioned God. She questioned her faith, the world. She was angry with everybody. Um, and it made her look at the world and, and try to figure out where was that change going to happen? It might have to start with her, but she didn't know how. 
So when those SNCC kids came to Ruleville to help register people in 1962 in August, she thought, well, maybe this is the opportunity. And she volunteered to try to register to vote. They took her. She marched right up those courthouse steps and took the test and, of course, failed. And when she got home that night, she was evicted by Mr. Marlowe. So that was her first step into trying to make a change to be the change she wanted to see. So um, over time, SNCC recognized her leadership qualities and they nurtured her and mentored her. In the meantime, she mentored them. They needed her. Those young people needed someone that was so grounded in this deep, profound commitment to family and community and her faith and wanting equality and justice and didn't know how to do it. And they had some of the tools that would help her. So um, it was through them that she emerged as a leader. And interestingly, she noticed that when she would go to these rallies that SNCC and, and other civil rights organizations would sponsor there in Mississippi, it was always the men on the stage that that gave all the talks and, and messaging. And Fannie Lou was often asked to come up and sing not necessarily give the speeches. So she watched and she observed, and eventually she found her way to that stage and gave speeches too. And I encourage anybody to go online and listen to some of those speeches because when she steps on the stage, the audience, the response is remarkable. You can feel the, the room change. You can feel that that preacher father of hers coming out in her voice. And she has this, this tempo to the way she talks and her voice will rise and then drop and get angry and she'll quote the Bible. She really stirred audiences. Um, so that was all well and good. And she was a, a community leader. But to get to the national stage, I saw one more moment that kind of shifted her, and I call it a rebirth. In June of 1963, she was arrested in Winona, Mississippi, with other SNCC workers who were returning from a voter registration program and nonviolent protesting uh, protest technique program. And they were arrested, taken to a jail, and for four days, they were physically and psychologically tortured. Hamer was um sexually assaulted. And when they came out on, it was the Wednesday that um, uh, Medgar Evers had been assassinated. When they came out of that jail, she could barely walk. Um, she was, she, she was deeply wounded, had injuries that she suffered for the rest of her life. She could have crawled home and never left, but she decided that they had been trying to kill her her whole life. So she was going to stand up and keep going until they actually killed her. And that was a rebirth moment. That anger, that fierceness just exploded on the stage, in her community, and for the nation. And in the book, you'll see the moments where the whole world watches her when she gives a speech at the Democratic National Convention. And there's no putting Fannie Lou Hamer back in the bottle. She really changes the world. So. Um, that's how I write my biographies, and um, that's how I discovered how this ordinary woman became an extraordinary, extraordinary person. Thank you very much. I think we're going to have a lot to talk about this afternoon. <laughs> so let me get right to it uh, and introduce the first discussant today, uh, Robert L. Harris, Jr., is Professor Emeritus of African American History, American Studies and Public Affairs at Cornell University, where he also served as Vice Provost for Diversity and Faculty Development. He is the author of Teaching African American History, published by the AHA in 2001, and the co-editor of the Columbia Guide to African American History since 1939, published in 2006. And I happen to actually be using it today, uh, coincidentally, uh, as I'm plotting out a civil rights seminar for undergraduates next semester. He's also the author of dozens of articles and book chapters, and is the former president of the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History. Robert, the Zoom room is all yours. 
Okay, now I've got it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure for me to be uh, on this uh, panel in this Zoom room uh, with uh, my colleague, Alelia Bundles, whom I've known for some time, and to uh, get to know Kate Larson through her work. Uh, let me say at the beginning that uh, I well, I thoroughly enjoyed the book, but saying enjoyed is not the best way for me to put it. Uh, my lineage goes back to Mississippi. My great-grandfather was a farmer. My grandfather uh, was a, owned a uh, shoe repair shop in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, which is one of the places that she refers to quite a bit. Uh, as many Northern families did, uh, my family sent me back South uh, during the summers until 1955. I was two years younger than Emmett Till. And after Emmett Till was lynched, I could no longer go back South. My sisters could, but I couldn't. Uh, I just want to share with you a particular incident. My uh, grandmother, gave me and my cousin some money to go to this little store to buy a pound of bologna. And uh, uh, the guy behind the counter said, what you boys want? I said, a pound of bologna. He said, what you boys want? I thought the man was hard of hearing. So I said, a pound of bologna. He looked at me and said, boy, you must not be from these parts. And if you don't say, sir, you might not get out of here alive. Well, of course, when I shared that uh, with, with my parents, that was part of the reason why uh, I could no longer uh, go back south after the uh, lynching of uh, Emmett Till. But as I read through the book, uh, there's certainly images that I remember using an outhouse, taking a bath in a tin tub because uh, my aunt that I stayed with did not have indoor plumbing, uh, visiting people's homes whose homes were, uh, well, I say wallpapered, but basically newspaper that was on the walls that was keeping out the uh, elements. So this book, brought some vivid uh, memories uh, to mind uh, for me. One of my interests is in the uh, interpretation and analysis of African-American history. And I think that um, Kate falls into line with those individuals who are now writing about the long freedom movement. This is not something that is some textbooks have it started December 1st, 1955, when Rosa Parks decided not to give up her seat on the bus in Montgomery. Uh, there are many individuals who want to start uh, the civil rights movement there, and they have sort of this episodic uh, analysis of the civil rights movement, of basically the Black freedom movement, of which the civil rights movement uh, was a part. So I think that uh, Kate fits into this uh, analysis of the long freedom struggle. And we can see that in uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, in her family. One of the questions that I had in mind as I started uh, reading this book was, how did Fannie Lou Hamer, I know, uh, Kate, you've given us, you know, some sense of her background, of her autobiography, but how did she come to resist the system in the way that she did? How did she stand up for herself and for what she saw as her rights as an American citizen? And I think you did a very good job of telling us about her mother and the influence that her mother had uh, on her. 
uh, I was struck by the pail that her mother took to the cotton fields with her and in which she had a gun. So Fannie Lou Hamer uh, really uh, got a lot of her um, spirit, I would say, from her mother. And then also there was, there's the issue, of course, of, of her faith. Uh, I think that uh, her faith was extremely uh, important. Uh, some people have looked at religion as being, well, I'll use the popular term, the opiate of the masses, but it wasn't uh, for Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, her experience reminds me of the song, I've got shoes, you've got shoes, all God's children got shoes, my Lord. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to take off my shoes. I'm going to sing. I'm going to shout all over God's heaven. But everybody talking about heaven ain't going there, heaven. So African-Americans, especially uh, under the institution of slavery and later under segregation and Jim Crow, realized that they were children of God and that uh, as children of God, they could resist their oppression. And I think that that's one of the things that worked for uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, I've got several questions that uh, I would like to pose. Uh, maybe I can't get them all out right now, but as the discussion goes on, uh, we might, uh, you might get a chance to uh, address uh, some of these questions. Um, well, you, you mentioned that Fannie Lou Hamer uh, was sort of behind the scenes. And I would like to know, was there a certain modesty that she had? Why didn't she take credit uh, for certain things? Uh, you say she indicated that she really did not know that much uh, about the uh, civil rights uh, movement. Um, what... Uh, you know, the, the Mississippi, uh, what was it called, commission um, that kept tabs on everyone, um, Mississippi State Sovereignty uh, Commission, did they play any role in that rivalry between the NAACP and SNCC and other organizations in Mississippi? Um, and uh, what role, I, I've read that at the uh, 64 uh, Democratic Party convention that um, Walter Ruther placed quite a bit of pressure on Martin Luther King Jr. And that uh, he threatened to cut off financial support for SCLC if King did not go along with um, the um, idea of them accepting a compromise for seating at the uh, convention. And let me just wrap it up right here. One more question as I say, there's some others that um, I can uh, get to you, get posed, but I was very much interested in um, the, uh, and I should say that at Cornell, we have uh, given that Michael Schorner was a student at Cornell University, we have a stained glass window in the chapel dedicated to Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner. Uh, Andrew Goodman's parents were students at Cornell, so there was some uh, connection there. But what I wanted to ask you about, and I know you're basically drawing here upon the work of John Dittmer, but you say that um, when the three failed to call in at the required 4 p.m. check time, colleagues in Meridian and Jackson began making inquiries. A mix-up of some sort with SNCC office in Atlanta impeded efforts to locate them. No one called the FBI until 9 p.m., a delay 
that may have cost the young men their lives. Now, you talk about the FBI and um, its duplicity, let's say, in looking at uh, violence against African-Americans in the South. So I'm wondering about whether the FBI had been called or not. Uh, would these young men's bodies have been found at that time? I'll, I'll close off there. I mean, we could go on for the whole evening <laughs> with this uh, very rich and well-documented book, I must say. Thank you. Kate, did you want to respond to some of those questions? Sure, I, I can think of a couple of them. Um, the NAACP and the rivalry. I, I think that the Sovereignty Commission that was established in the um, 1950s, I think it played into that at some point, but the rivalry had been there for years before. And the NAACP um, had a different sort of status in the state versus other state organizations. So, um, I think they they played into it a little bit, but they were much more concerned about local grassroots people, at least by the time Hamer gets noticed. And she wasn't noticed until 1963. Um, so I think uh, they just took advantage of things that were already happening on the ground. Um, and the um, Walter Rotha, he's really, it's complicated. That whole scenario, day by day, hour by hour that I researched, going back and forth between Johnson's phone calls, because all those tapes are now digitized and, and um, uh, they're in text and you can read them, you can listen to them. You know, he was worried. He, he wasn't even sure if Walter... Um, Rother was going to be able to to handle the whole situation. And I wasn't so sure he was going to be able to do it because the passions were running so high, especially after Hamer's speech, because um, uh, congressmen, delegates were getting flooded with telegrams in Atlantic City and in Washington, D.C. So the pressure was mounting. And, they, you know, Johnson and, and Humphrey and everybody had to walk this very fine line. So I, yeah, I'm not so sure. I, and I am disappointed with King, but you know, he 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 just was not a, a Fannie Lou Hamer type of person, and he was more in line with the other elite men, basically, that were in that room. So that's where I see um, some of that happening. So I'll pause there, and we can get on to some of the other questions. But I'd love uh, Alilia to to give her comments too. Terrific. Before we continue, let me ask that uh, those of you in the listening audience, watching audience, who wish to pose a question, now is the time to start thinking about that. You can get in the queue, as Christian said, with the raise hand function in Zoom that we prefer so we can call on you, but you can also use the Q&A function as well and post your question. I get to read it, not you, but either way, this is the moment to uh, uh, start getting ready for that. All right, business is out of the way. Our next discussant, is Alilia Bundles, an award-winning journalist and the author of On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, published in 2001. It was not only a New York Times notable book, but the basis for a Netflix series, Self Made, that appeared last year. She has a career spanning three decades as an executive and Emmy award-winning producer with ABC and, and NBC News. She founded the Madam Walker Family Archives and is on the advisory board of the March on Washington Film Festival, the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America at Radcliffe's, uh, at the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard, and the Smithsonian's American Women's History Initiative. She's currently working on a new book, The Joy Goddess of Harlem, Alilia Walker and the Harlem Renaissance, a biography of her great grandmother. Alilia, the Zoom room is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and Kate, congratulations first. Uh, thank you for formidable research and insightful critique. Uh, Walk With Me is an important contribution to American history, to political history, and to our understanding of women in the civil rights and social justice movements. I very much appreciated having so much detail about Fannie Lou Hamer's childhood. 
Uh, when you talked about your approach to writing biographies, I will say those qualities you were striving for come through. Uh, that richness of the narrative gives us context for the person Mrs. Hamer would become. You help us see what she witnessed and what she experienced so that we can better understand the forces that shaped her inner life and created a foundation for her resilience. Reading about how W.T. Saunders cheated Joe Pullen of the money he was owed and then shot him in the arm and then how Pullen was murdered by a mob took my breath away. Knowing that Mrs. Hamer was an avid reader who won spelling bees as a child showed how much potential she had. And at the same time, it was heartbreaking because it was a reminder of how the potential of thousands of other children was never realized. Robert and I were both struck by that image of her mother, uh, Ella Townsend, carrying a nine millimeter Luger in a bucket in the fields every day. Um, it showed the forces that helped shape Fannie Lou Hamer's courage and fierceness. But then there was more heartbreak to know that Ella Hamer's blindness could have been prevented with a little medical care. And yet with all the daily stress and what surely had to have been rage with all of those things you were describing in your opening remarks, she still managed to endure the beatings and the death threats and then to dig deeper into her soul to fortify herself and the people she led with this little light of mine. So some of that same resilience that you talk about with Fannie Lou Hamer is some of the same resilience uh, that I found in studying the life of Madam Walker, another daughter, daughter of the Delta. You know, how did these, that question that you're asking, how did these people become something beyond the ordinary lives that they were consigned to? Um, before I ask my question, I just want to say after reading chapter 10, I watched Mrs. Hamer's August 22nd 1964 testimony before the DNC's Credentials Committee. Every time I watch that testimony, I'm inspired because of her courage. And every time I watch, I'm also angered and frustrated because of what she experienced and because of what is still happening in 2021. Your account helped us understand the drama from the trip from Mississippi to Atlantic City to the arrival of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party at the convention hall. And then Lyndon Johnson's attempt to cut off the coverage by telling the networks that he was going to announce his vice presidential selection and then not even mentioning Hubert Humphrey's name in those remarks. I, that's something I didn't know. Thank you for filling in that blank. As you say, Johnson thought he had dodged a publicity nightmare. In the ballroom, however, no one knew that NBC had paused coverage during Hamer's testimony. The crowd grew more still. Hamer was sweating, her whole body weeping with perspiration. You know, as a writer, I just loved <laughs> that line. Her voice flowed in a rhythm, climbing louder and growing forceful with anger and anguish, then dropping into a near whisper when she ran out of breath. So thank you for taking us into that moment with such detail and drama. So one cannot read Walk With Me without thinking about our current political state. Uh, in the epilogue, you talk about how Hamer wrestled with discrimination, poverty, and disenfranchisement, uh, those issues that remain unresolved. So each day as we watch the news, we're reminded of how much work still needs to be done, whether it's voter suppression, the organized campaign to prevent schools from teaching accurate history. I suspect your book may end up on a banned book list uh, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, the trials in Wisconsin and Georgia. But I just wanted to ask, you know, as Mrs. Hamer's story inspires and fortifies us, um, how are you thinking about our current state of political affairs? And congratulations again. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was really wonderful and great. And um, I, so Hamer fought, was fighting for things we're still fighting for today. Um, I'll put voter uh, registration aside just for a minute, but, you know, she was fighting for, um, you know, uh, medical equity, um, preschool education, universal preschool education, universal health care. Um, uh, you know, she fought food insecurity. She brought a freedom farm and a, um, 
uh, a pig bank to the community to help people survive the winter, which was the most difficult time for sharecroppers and laborers because they didn't have any work. So we're still fighting for those things. We're still, you know, it, it just is remarkable to me. Um, and then voter registration. Now, I, it, it didn't occur to me when I had been thinking about her for a couple of decades um, about the voter registration issue. But in 2013, in um, the Shelby case where the Supreme Court sort of dismantled the parts of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that had really changed the landscape so that got rid of the poll taxes and the literacy tests and and sent federal um, watchers into formerly southern states that that had tried to um, block black people from voting. They overturned some of those um uh, laws. And so that started this voting rights thing all over again. And I, I, so maybe that's why Hamer started getting louder and louder in my brain that, you know, she went through this and here we are doing it again. And it's, you know, six, eight years later, it seems worse than in 2013. It is worse. And I think, and Mrs. Hamer would be shocked on the one hand and then maybe actually not surprised um, and that she would be looking to communities today to fight like she fought. And um, for those of us uh, who aren't in a position to fight, to support the people that are out there fighting and to look for the ordinary people in our communities like the Fannie Lou Hamers who can rise up out of what seem to be obscure or unnoticed now, they could they could take on the world and change the world. So um, that's her legacy and that's what I see happening. So it gives me hope because she changed the world and uh, it can happen again. Thank you. Now we're gonna open this up uh, to those in the audience. John Martin uh, has had his hand up. Um, we would ask you to unmute yourself and to pose your question. John. If you unmute. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, I'm a retired journalist and a former colleague of Aaliyah, but, but to Kate, Robert, and Aaliyah, I just want to say thank you for presenting these details, which are so important in every narrative, but you've gotten to the bottom of the narratives that you are involved in in such an important way, and we we're all in your debt. And I, I, for white people, it's painful and necessary that we learn these details and you're helping. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Steve Lipsom, your hand is up. Please unmute and ask a question. Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I guess two questions. Uh, one is like, given that they were both uh, Black Baptists, uh, could you compare and contrast uh, Daniel Hamer and Martin Luther King in terms of their faith and their faith's effect on their civil rights work? Uh, and my second question is, uh, what was your approach to uh, oral history and how you balance use of documents with use of interviews? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Those are two great questions. Um, so I think the most obvious difference between Martin Luther King and Fannie Lou Hamer is that um, she, he was elite. There's, there's no way to get around it. And she was um, this uh, ordinary woman in the Mississippi Delta who had a voice, like many people had a voice, and she didn't have a platform like Martin Luther King and, and the support that he had. So she has a, I, I'm, my words are failing me, but she was 
uh, scrappier in a way. And that had great appeal to the public. Millions of Americans could identify with Fannie Lou Hamer, whereas they didn't necessarily find themselves identifying with a Martin Luther King, even though they listened to him and were inspired by him. But when she spoke, people felt a connection to her. There was something about her that was relatable and um, touchable. And, um, and she, she just seared into people's, you know, hearts and minds and um, their emotions. So that's the difference I see. And I'm, I, I think it's, it goes beyond being a Baptist. It's about someone's skill and leadership and being able to connect with your audience and the people around you. So they both had that, but in different ways. Um, I think you have a section. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I think you have a section in the book where you talk about uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton's analysis of Fannie Lou Hamer's uh, speeches. And I mean, that's just an exceptional uh, assessment uh, by Eleanor Holmes Norton. But one of the things that appears to me is that the class distinction it seemed to be more uh, the men who looked at uh, Fannie Lou Hamer as being unlettered, uh, as opposed to the women who did not seem to have a problem uh, as much, I would say, with Fannie Lou Hamer. That's a great observation, and that is true. Um, and also, this was a problem in the civil rights movement. Women in the movement complained about the men dominating the stage and the movement, the messaging, and they were doing, the women were doing a lot of the work and doing messaging in a different way that was very effective, but the men were taking the credit. So it was the time period uh, where men certainly had all the positions of power and, um, and, and, the women, this is so typical of women that they, it's a, it's a gender thing. Women will stick together and help each other. And um, it didn't matter that, that Mrs. Hamer had only, you know, a sixth grade education. She was powerful as a person and um, other women supported her, were attracted to that and, um, and felt powerful because of her. And so that's important. Um, I'd also like to mention the the question that was that came before about oral history versus documents. Um, so I always check everything. You know, there are so much oral testimony and um, oral histories from civil rights veterans, and some of the, there are oral histories taken at the moment in time in the 1960s up until even today. There are still people that are being interviewed and giving testimony. Um, some people uh, change their stories and or add detail, which is great, or they mix up details or. Um, or embellish. So I always had to go back to the documents and try to find out where the, the actual story or what I perceived to be the actual story was. So I couldn't rely on just one person's testimony. I think of um, um, Charlie Cobb and uh, Charles McLaren. They gave a lot of interviews and they're, I encourage everybody to go and read and listen to these interviews. Uh, and they just are coming to my mind right now, but there were others like them. But over time, they would add details and um, and flourishes to the stories. And I they made me smile every time I read them. But I had to go back and document the time, what was written at the time, you know, those sorts of things. So I, I that's how, why I, that's the way I am as a historian. I have to double check everything. Every other biography that it was has been written about Hamer, I checked all the sources because I know some, you know, people read things differently and I had to see those sources myself. Well, I just like to add that uh, one of the things that I often think about and when I taught my classes, I would uh, explain to my students that if everyone who said they marched with Martin Luther King Jr., if they actually did march with him, 
he'd probably still be alive today. <laughs> but I mean, you get or everyone who was at the March on Washington. When you uh, hear that, you know, it makes you wonder, could it have could could the um, place have held uh, all of the people who say that they were at the March on Washington, who really weren't. But I just wanted to add that. So, Kate, I would just, you know, I, I am, am total, in total agreement with you on this need to check and double check um, because myths um, abound, especially with famous people. I mean, I know I, it's certainly in my work, one of the, the main stories about Madam Walker was not true. And I'm finding the same thing as I'm working on the, a biography on her daughter, Lilia Walker, a story that's often repeated by scholars whose work I respect, <laughs> but who haven't done that primary uh, document uh, research. And the fact that you have, as you say, over time, these oral histories are changing. I mean, it's great that the people who participated that we still have some of those folks alive uh, to be able to double check. But it is so important to check and double check and cross reference. And you have done a marvelous job. Thank you. And those oral histories, I'd like to say that some of them, um, you know, those who gave oral histories over decades, um, some of them have felt more liberated to tell more detail. And so that's been very helpful too. For whatever reasons, you know, they couldn't say what they wanted to say in the 60s or 70s, but they can in 2014. So, or people ask a different question or in a different way, and it, it triggers a, 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 a memory. So, um, all those interviews are so, so important. And also, you know, I had to, I had to check everything that Hamer said, because she didn't, she manufactured things about her life. And, um, so I had to check them like the 20th child. And so, well, where were all those siblings? Like I, I wanted to know who her family was. I look at census records and then they start showing, well, two ch children had died then and another child died then. And then, so, you know, it's important. You have, you can't take people at their word all the time. You have to double check. And there was an earlier question. I think Robert, you asked about FBI records um, and, and trusting the FBI. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and all of those civil rights workers did not trust the FBI, and I don't blame them because you can see in those FBI files that they were not taking things seriously or they were they were looking the other way when things were happening. So um, when uh, the three young SNCC workers were murdered and no one called or they it was said that no one called till nine o'clock, the FBI, I have no way of knowing because no one recorded whether they had been called or notified. And maybe those records will show up someday. I don't know, but it's really difficult dealing with FBI records. Um, very difficult because you have to consider the source and they weren't always truthful. Um, I think we all have our experiences with, if we work with oral history or FBI records, you know, always, always interrogate the sources um, I'm writing a biography of A. Philip Randolph and the story that he tells about his early life. I think he believes it, but I don't. Uh, and I think the sources show that he has embellished the story over the years. And with regard to FBI files, similarly, you know, I'm glad as an historian, someone may be writing these reports, but they're often just dead wrong. They have no idea what they're looking at. But just to stick with the source issue for a moment, Christian, uh, I think you have a question uh, that you would like to pose. Sure. Um, I mean, it, I, I love this discussion. This is a, just a wonderful conversation, very rich. And I, I also think it's really great we're talking about sources in this sort of post-fact age. I think it's really important um, uh, our audiences understand that these books are written based on historical sources of all kinds. I do, I do want to sort of uh, follow up in, in, in two ways on that. Um, you know, when you write a biography, when you try to get into um, Fanny Lehammer's mind, you, you do, I mean, not everything can be documented. Um, you need to take a leap of faith based on the best knowledge, your best instinct as a historian. Um, were there those moments? Are there those issues where um, you really, um, you know, had to um, uh, go beyond what you could document? Um, 
so that's that's one question. The other question is related one on sources. Um, you've already mentioned the FBI files, but were there any document collections or sources uh, that were sort of an aha moment, a kind of a breakthrough moment that really pushed you forward in terms of, of the biography? And then <clears throat> uh, less about sources, but about the earlier um, biographies. Could you just um, position your biography in, the, in, in its historiographical context, especially in some of the other biographical writing or sketches um, about Hamer. Um, I think that would help our, our audience to understand how your book fits in. Thank you. Thank you. Th those are great questions. Um, so I'm going to start with your first um, question about how did I fill in um, the missing, the silence in those records. And um, so after, you know, living with Mrs. Hamer and all those documents, there were those moments where I felt that I could take a leap and say, this is what I think she, like the, the two moments where I view that she had a rebirth, that she was reborn after the sterilization and after the beating in Winona. I just, there, she's transformed. And I, I think she knew it and, but she might not have said it that way, but so I could talk about that and how, you know, um, how did she tell Pap? What did she tell Pap that she had been sexually assaulted? How do you tell a, a husband? And also she knows that a black man in Mississippi, you know, he's at risk. If she's going to tell him that detail, is he going to go and exact revenge and get himself killed or it's so complicated. So I had to talk about that, even though I don't know if she thought all those things and what their conversation was, I had to fill in those gaps a little bit, just thinking, trying to think through it. Um, breakthrough moments were, um, gosh, there were so many. <laughs> it's hard to say, I guess, it's just the way I do the work, putting all of the oral histories together, all of the primary documents. I have to give a shout out to um, the SNCC Legacy Project and to the Civil Rights Veterans uh, Project because they have been documenting, collecting documents from everybody, scanning them, putting them online. The University of, uh, you know, universities in the South, uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society, everybody is trying to scan and document and make sure all these things are, are, are preserved. So I benefited a lot from all of those resources. And, um, so and also the FBI files. So Hamer's FBI file is heavily redacted, and I applied to have it unredacted. And it was before the pandemic, and like it took a year. And then they got back to me and said, "Oh, it's going to cost this much." Blah 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 blah. I said, "Okay, fine." And then the pandemic hit, and I couldn't get the the they wouldn't scan it and do all that. Um, I'm grateful to. Um, uh, Davis Hawk, who provided some of the photographs that were in the file. and um, But I discovered online, you know, there are people out there that just have gifts and they are dedicated to just putting history out online. And I found the FBI files for the other SNCC activists who were arrested with her and um, in Winona. And every detail that was redacted in Mrs. Hamer's file is wide open in those files. So I could match the pages and they, so it was like, you know, why did they redact her file and not everybody else's? <laughs> so um, those were great moments. Like, oh my gosh, you know, this page is, is, all written on and the other in hers is all blacked out. So those are fabulous moments where you just, uh, I just love the internet and those anonymous people out there that put them on the internet archive for everybody to see. Um, and then your last question, I forgot what your last question. Oh, oh, the, um, the other bio, the historiography. There were several great biographies out there. Um, Kay Mills wrote the first back in the 1990s. 
And she was a journalist and she documented, she met Hamer and um, lots of people that were alive at the time she interviewed. And so she wrote a, a great biography of Hamer. Um, and that was followed by China Kai Lee's um, dissertation turned book for freedom's sake in 2001, another fabulous um, biography. And then uh, Megan Parker Brooks and Davis Hawk have both published works on Hamer over the years that are just, they've analyzed her speeches and her her rhetoric, her politics. Um, it, there's just a rich body of work on Hamer. And there are articles too. Um, so I felt like I was standing on amazing uh, shoulders when I started this project. But I just knew that um, given the way I write biographies and what I'm looking for, that I, I felt I could add something to the historiography. Um, and, you know, those little details about you know, her family and uh, many more things, but I, I, I'm just that type of biographer. So I think I've just added on top of what was rich historiography to begin with. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sonia Michelle, your hand is up. Please unmute. Let's hear your question. Join the conversation. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Okay. This sounds like a fabulous book and I really look forward to reading it. Um, just picking up on a comment you just made in the last uh, in response to one of Christian's questions, could you say more about the relationship between Fannie Lou and Pap Hamer? And would you say that it was typical of African American couples at the time? I mean, this is these are the decades of Ozzie and Harriet and so forth. And you know, so I have a sense of of what a lot of white marriages were like. I, I wonder if you could say, or maybe it's just going too far, that African American marriages were different or whether theirs was atypical or whatever, and maybe also a little bit about her parents' marriage and the patterns there and whether there was something about their relationship that, that influenced the way she and Pap related. Um, so when I looked at um, uh, the Hamer's marriage, I just looked at it as another marriage, and there's only so much we can know about the interior of someone else's marriage. So that's the way I treated it as not as a black family marriage versus a white marriage. It was their marriage. And I write about their marriage. Um, um, uh, Fannie Lou Townsend actually had been married before to a guy named Charlie Gray from Ruleville, Mississippi. She married him in 1938. They divorced in 1943. It's not clear if they ever lived together, I don't understand how that marriage happened because she was taking care of her mother and living separately from Charlie Gray. Um, he went off to fight in World War II. He filed for divorce before he left, and he claimed that they didn't have a marriage and that um, Fannie Lou was living with another man. Well, in 1944, she married Pap Hamer. So I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm assuming she was living with Pap Hamer at the time. He had been married before as well. So they had in their marriage. They clearly, they loved each other. Um, they adopted these two girls together. Um, but Pap stepped out on Hamer. And I write about it, that in the book. She has, uh, he has a couple of children with other women in the community. I can just imagine how painful that was for Hamer, who wanted children with Pap, and, and it, it wasn't happening, and um, he was having children with other women. So that, that was the reality, and I just wrote it that way. I'm, I wasn't going to make a judgment or say, oh, that's atypical, typical. It was just Pap and, and Fannie Lou in their marriage. Um, so... That's the answer to that. And, and family members told me about um, Pap, you know, stepping out. I'm using that word, stepping out on, on Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, and, I, and I discovered the children in census records and obituaries and things like that. So uh, it wasn't a secret. And I'm grateful to the family members that, that explained it to me and told me. And they were honest about it. And, and um, Fannie Lou Hamer lived with that. And that's... Those are the facts. Thank you. Carolyn Reuter, your hand is up. Please unmute, join the conversation. Um, okay. I was a reporter at WGBH in Boston um, and I interviewed Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, 
and had a wonderful day with her. She was, I thought, very articulate and very moving when she described how she'd been beaten up and her skin was like leather. She showed me her arm. Um, do, have you looked at her biography, she, autobiography, which was published by um, Beacon Press in Boston? Um, is that the pr to praise uh, the bridges? That was I don't name. recall the yeah. name of it. It'd be in the yeah. 60s. Yeah, that's the name of it. So um, when I talked about, um, when I wrote about what happened in the Winona jail, it's a very hard chapter to read. I'm, I'm telling everybody right now, it was very hard to write. And um, I, I write in very minute graphic detail about what happened from the time they were arrested till the time they were released. And it's horrifying. And I took those records, I, I wrote from the FBI records and from uh, conversations that Hamer had, and um, I was able to piece together and also interviews that I had with people that knew Hamer, who told me that um, Hamer told them that she had been raped, but that she didn't really talk about that to the press. She hinted at it, but she didn't come out and say it. So um, what you read in that chapter is based on um, the doctor's reports, the trial of the uh, police officers. There was a trial. The federal government charged them and they were tried. There's, you know, 1,100 pages of testimony in that trial that's very graphic and in great detail about what happened uh, to Mrs. Hamer and the other uh, activists. So, um, I, yeah, what happened to her was, was brutal and terrible, and it's amazing that she survived, but it did affect her health for the rest of her life. Thank you. I think she went on a book tour, so it was interesting. Thank you. We have numerous questions in the Q&A, and I'm going to group two of them together that speak to the political impact of her activism. Uh, and if there is an iconic moment uh, in which people outside the academy and the civil rights community perhaps know Fannie Lou Hamer, it's the 64 Democratic National Convention and her immortalized uh, words before the Credential Committee. Phil Miller asks, thank you for this book and this event. Can you expand upon Hamer's long-term impact on the Democratic Party and the larger presence of women and people of color at subsequent conventions in 68 and 72? And Dean Blobaum asks, did Hamer play a role in the reform efforts in the Democratic Party that followed the 68 convention? Was the substance of her speech at the convention in August of 68 primarily concerned with the seating of black delegates from the South, or did it intersect with the concerns of white anti-war activists who wanted more democracy in selecting a nominee for president? Um, so uh, she actually was part of the movement to um, have more um, racial equity and gender equity in the Democratic Party nominating process in the in the delegation in the DNC. And she was a member of the DNC from um, 1968 to 1971. So she was on the board to make decisions about going forward. Her efforts, what she caused that stir in 1964 was um, the Democratic Party made a commitment that other Southern states going forward or states going forward would have to have um, desegregated or uh, integrated delegations. And um, in 1968, there were 350 um, that 50 or 70 um, African-American delegates at that convention. That never would have happened without Fannie Lou Hamer, in my opinion. She really, and the, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, their efforts to show up in 1964 and demand a voice, demand to be, to represent the people of Mississippi affected the Democratic Party so that in 1968, it was in more inclusive. And she campaigned for more women to be part of it. And as I mentioned earlier, she was tired of seeing only only men on stages, and they were the ones that were making all the decisions. She fought to get more women in positions of power. And she became part of the founding uh, group of women who established the um, the National Women's Political Caucus. Um, and she was um, 
just powerful and and um, she was part of the the feminist movement that was demanding much all over the country in many different places. Um, but she also was a very conservative feminist who locked heads with younger feminists. Um, and but she had a place at the table, and so she expanded the conversation for everybody. And um, so when she gave her speech at the convention in 1968, she received a standing ovation because she she saw the fruit of her labor. It really was a, an important moment. She was against the Vietnam War. She couldn't understand why we were across the world fighting for someone else's liberty when people in Mississippi were not free and did not have equality. And she couldn't understand why poor and black young men were going over to fight that war when they didn't have those rights at home. So she was very vocal about that and um, campaigned against um, the Vietnam War um, during her life. Thank you. Carol Johnson has a hand up. Please unmute and pose your question. No, I don't have a question. Oh, all right then. <laughs> I thought I saw a hand, but thank you for letting us know. Um, Lorma Rackley asks in the Q&A, the men and women of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, seem to highly value Fannie Lou Hamer. Could age have been a factor when you talk of the reaction to her from people who felt more attached to Dr. King's leadership? That's an interesting question and observation. I, I, I'd like to talk about the SNCC um, students and young people. They, you know, they had been brought in under the, the um, mentorship of Ella Baker, who worked for the um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference under Martin Luther King. She was the highest positioned woman in the organization, but she had nowhere to go and she should have gone higher, but they just weren't going to push a woman more forward. But she saw the spark and the power and the passion of young people, and she organized them into SNCC. Now, uh, King and the leadership, they weren't so keen on that, but she knew that these young people who were doing the lunch counter sit-ins and the freedom rides, that there was a power there. They were becoming the change that everyone wanted to see. And so she taught them that they could to go into Mississippi and to, to not be leaders themselves, even though many of them would go on to become leaders, you know, Bob Moses and John Lewis and many of them. Um, she said, you have to find the leaders in the community and support them. And when they went to Ruleville, they saw Fannie Lou Hamer step off that bus when everyone else was afraid on that bus to get off and go try to register to vote. She marched right into that courthouse. And then after they left the courthouse and the police and all the, you know, white supremacist yahoos were, you know, harassing them on the highway and they were stopped and, and fined for driving a bus, the wrong color yellow. Um, she started singing songs to calm everybody down. She's like, you know, we're going to, we're going to be okay. We're going to survive this. And then when she was evicted, she just, it was devastating. She cried in front of them, but then she picked herself up and, and kept moving on. And they recognized that the community had their leader and that SNCC had to support her. And that's what they did. So some of them looked at her as a mother figure. There's no question about that, but she had such wisdom and she taught them and, um, you know, she shared her faith with them, which some of them didn't have as strong a faith. And she taught them about not having hate and um, that you couldn't live with yourself if you lived with hate like those white supremacists live with. And so she transformed many of those young people. Many of them were, were became different people because of, of Mrs. Hamer. And so that attests to her sort of innate natural born leadership that needed fertile soil to grow and SNCC was that fertile soil. One of the questions I've got in the back of my mind is uh, what was it? I know that you've looked at uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and her family background, uh, which in many respects gave her the courage to resist uh, the oppression that 
African Americans basically faced there in the South, but there are others that you also examine in the book. I mean, this is not like many people refer to Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington, which makes me cringe because when you look at the March on Washington, there were so many individuals who were involved. It would not have been successful without those other individuals. Likewise, the um, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party would not have been successful without other courageous individuals. But I, I don't know, I, I wanna use the word secret, but I, I don't think that that's the case. What was it that distinguished Fannie Lou Hamer and many of those other individuals who experienced the violence, the threats, and what have you, uh, but still they marched on. Uh, it's it's hard to describe and imagine. Um, they each of the piece, so there were so many of these heroes in Mississippi. I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer kind of rose out of Mississippi and was on a national stage, but there were many still in Mississippi who didn't have that stage, but they were there with her. And I think they all they all supported each other and were obligated to each other. And they had that sense of community that was so important. And um, that community could be the church community, their physical neighborhood community, community of, of family and friends, and their and the children and younger generations. There were there were so many older people like Hamer and even older than her, 20, 30 years older than her, that were out there doing this, putting their lives at risk. Some of them were murdered. And uh, it, it's stunning to me, but they knew they had to fight because it had been too long and things weren't changing. And if, you know, if they weren't going to be the change, who was going to be the change? They needed change and they were the, the change they, they, they wanted to see. And that made young people, um, really young people like teenagers. I'm thinking of like the Ladner sisters and, and um, so many of them and, and, and Disha May Holland and all these people who were inspired by these older people that were from their neighborhoods that they looked up as, you know, old, old Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer. But then she's out there facing down the police on the street and the kids are like, yeah, this is, this is great. So, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer loved that, knew that was important, an important image for the community to see because, you know, white people from the North and these SNCC kids, black and white, were not going to make the change complete. It had to be the local people. And I, so uh, there's so much more about Mississippi. It is incredible, the people there that fought. And I know they were in Alabama and Georgia. I know Mississippi, and I'm just saying the courage those people had, I, it, there should be monuments all over the state of Mississippi to all those people that fought along with Fannie Lou Hamer and more. Christopher Crawford asks a question. Mrs. Hamer was strongly against abortion. How do you see the relationship between her belief on that issue, which we think of as more conservative today, compared to her progressive views on other issues? So um, Fannie Lou Hamer came to that position and I see that as an evolving position after her sterilization, that it wasn't a position she held before that. It was only after that, that it, it evolved. Um, and there was so much going on in Mississippi. And at, even after, after 64 and 65, and she started focusing more on the community in Mississippi, she was seeing what was happening to young women who were having children out of wedlock and how they were being treated by school systems and their employers and, and um, uh, federal benefits and access to health care. She felt that every woman should be able to do and have children and be supported by the community and the government if it took the government to make sure that they were a whole. So uh, it, it evolved for her after her sterilization because she was not, did not believe that before the sterilization. It's just something she came to. And I know it really bothered some of those 
um, other feminists. They were very black and white feminists had a hard time with her about that position. So we have two questions that uh, speak to family issues. Uh, Annette Wadia Nelson asks what happened to the children adopted by Ms. Hamer and her husband. Uh, and Shoshana Brower asks, how did her work impact her relationship with her children? Are they alive? Could you talk to them? So um, her oldest daughter, Dorothy, um, died in um, the 1966-67 um, after giving birth to her second child. She had anemia and um, became very ill and died suddenly. It was, it was terrible and horrible. And um, Pap and Fannie Lou raised their two granddaughters, uh, Dorothy's two children. Their other daughter, Virgie, um, was a teenager during the 1960s. And she traveled with um, Hamer around the country when she would give uh, speeches sometimes. And she went to the Newport folk festival with Hamer and sang with her on stage. I mean, that was exciting for 13 year old Virgie. Um, there, there were struggles in the family. Um, as Virgie got older, she resented what her mother was doing and being gone so much. And so that was difficult at times. Um, and Pap, you know, had to take care of the household when Fannie Lou was traveling and getting paid, but it was hard on them as a family that she was gone so much. So it was, it was complicated. It was very complicated. And, and uh, Mrs. Hamer tried to do whatever she could to, to keep things going smoothly um, when she was home. It was, it was a struggle. It was hard. Um, so Virgie, did not um, get into the movement. She died in 2019. One of the granddaughters, Lenora, died in 19, uh, 2017, uh, um, Virgie in 2019. And Jackie is uh, still alive. And I did interview her. And um, she's just lovely. Her voice just is beautiful. And um, so she, I did interview her. And she's still living in Mississippi. So I am going to get my question in now, but I have a comment, an observation, and, and a question that I'd like to ask. And one of the things that struck me so vividly in the book was, not, not that I suppose we need reminding of this, but, but maybe we do, of just how exhausting the work that Fannie Lou Hamer and so many other activists did was. Um, uh, you know, the, the psychological stress, the physical stress. Uh, and I think you do a remarkable job um, as you trace uh, Mrs. Hamer's travels around Mississippi or around the nation, raising money for the movement. She is much in demand. You convey, I think, quite effectively just how physically difficult this is at times. It hurts, not just the beatings, which are brutally described uh, and very effectively conveyed, but also just the day-to-day -day work of movement organizing. Um, you know, her health is not good, yet she's on the road constantly. Um, so that's just not something that comes out as clearly, I think, in, in many civil rights studies. And I appreciated it uh, and felt it uh, in this book. My question has to do with um, the politics of the late 60s um, in Mississippi and Fannie Lou Hamer's particular role vis-a-vis -vis other local and or state activists. The movement is never a singular entity in which everyone speaks with one voice. Uh, even though we talk of the civil rights movement, there are many factions, there are many organizations, there are many visions, there are many egos. In the latter part of the 60s, she is at odds with other activists you know, in the region. SNCC has evolved uh, and has adopted a set of positions that some of which she is not comfortable uh, with, and then they kind of pack up and, and move on. Uh, but other local state activists um, you know, form their own rivals to the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party uh, and have different visions. So how would you place her in Mississippi politics and Mississippi civil rights politics in the latter part of the 1960s? She has a position. Um, she is influential, she does things, but 
there is a sense in which it's not as successful, certainly as she would like, um, uh, and and it contrasts somewhat more harshly, perhaps, um, than with her earlier kind of moral intervention. So if you could just expand a bit uh, on Mississippi, Hamer, and the politics of Mississippi. So I think you describe that pretty well. And so I this is, Hamer's health plays a role in what happens to her later in the 60s and how Mississippi evolves. So she, there are um, other Democratic forces in the state that want to uh, take the Mississippi Freedom Demo Democratic Party in a slightly different direction. And Hamer was always just had her vision and that was it. And um, so the Charles Evers, Medgar Evers' brother, wanted to take the party in a different direction. And Aaron Henry and others sort of followed that route. They wanted to take the, the, the party in a different direction and make it bigger, much, much bigger. And Hamer still was very rooted in Ruleville and on the ground in Mississippi. And her vision it, it had this moral focus and she wasn't going to give up on it. And so by 66, 67, SNCC has moved on without her, basically. It's taken a different direction. Um, I've read some of the minutes of meetings that SNCC had and uh, the things that they said about Mrs. Hamer were so unkind. They were just like, you know, Stokely Carmichael was done with her. You know, she's basically an old lady. We don't need her anymore. We're going to go out and we're going to march and we're going to carry guns. And we're going to do this. And um, so she's sort of left behind and she can see it happening, even though she loved all all those young people and she knew they had to go on their own direction. And so she focused more on trying to shape what's happening in Mississippi. And there were younger people that were trying to take it in a different direction. And she struggled with that. And I think part of it was she didn't have a mentor anymore and she still needed a mentor. And she had been a mentor for so many people, but uh, she hadn't grown up in a world of politics and she just had this focus, this singular focus, and she couldn't sustain it, especially because her health was so precarious. She, you know, she had, she would collapse in physical ex exhaustion and she'd have to go to doctors because her kidney was acting up and, and her hypertension and diabetes. And so it, it drained her. So she didn't have the energy to fight for her cause, her message, but she was still powerful enough to rein in that new loyalist democratic party that ended up going to the convention in Chicago in 1968. She still had a powerful voice and Charles Evers and that crowd, they knew she still had that voice. Um, and so she still managed to be powerful, but she was losing that power over time. And she became more and more focused on the landscape in Mississippi and feeding people and um, and trying to work with people to let's let's all come together and have preschool education. Let's decide on how it's going to be done. When the fe federal money send federal government sends in money, then people start competing. Oh, it's their vision of the preschool education. No, it's their vision. And. It, it, she wasn't ready for that. She was not ready. And there was no one to support her. It was She was by herself. She carried a huge load, a huge load. And so it's it's hard to, 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 um, to watch. And also it's regrettable. That's why I say when you see people in your community today that are doing these hard things, support them. And, um, and if you can be a mentor to somebody, mentor them because they can't carry it forward without it. It's too exhausting. Thank you. Can I ask you in closing, uh, just to share some, some words about a particular incident um, or exchange in the book. So Hamer and Malcolm X you know, find themselves in conversation. And as I was reading this, I'm thinking, teaching moment. Um, I've got to incorporate these documents and these exchanges uh, in the seminar that I'll be doing. But could you, uh, for, for our audience, you know, talk about uh, their discussion, their exchange of views? So Malcolm X um, believed in segregation. He believed that um, you know, African-Americans should separate from whites, have their own businesses, own schools, everything segregated. This was the exact opposite of what Hamer wanted. She had lived that segregated life. She didn't want it 
and she didn't believe it was right that we're all God's children. We should all be together. And Malcolm X wasn't going to have any of it. And she she respected him because he was a leader and she wanted to support him. But it was hard for her because she didn't believe that that was the right path for her people. That's what she was saying. This is this is not the right path. Um, and so, she, you know, she was the, there was tension there, but she never was you know, critical of anybody, really. She just was like, mm, I, I disagree with you. And he disagreed with her dramatically. And then after they met, um, like two months later, he was assassinated. And um, so that was, that was very powerful and painful for her. Thank you. We really could go on for, I think, quite a bit of time more, but unfortunately I have to draw this to a close. So I want to say thank you so much uh, to Kate, to Alilia, to Robert, uh, and to Christian uh, for this session. And thanks to those of you who posed questions and apologies to those whose questions we couldn't get to. Christian, final words. Sure. Thank you, Eric. Um, please join us on November 29th for a session on After 100 Winters in Search of Reconciliation on America's Stolen Lands. And again, thanks to Kate, Alilia, Robert, and of course, Eric, for just an amazing conversation this afternoon. Thank you all so much. And Can thanks we so ask much Kate for joining. about her next project? Uh, I, I'm not ready to talk about it yet. <laughs> and we're out of time. I'm sorry. Yeah. So thanks to our audience for listening and engaging. We're adjourned. Stay safe and good night. <laughs>